Welcome everyone to the beginning of the SummerSlam review series here on OTRS Central. Here's how this is going to work. Starting today and every day afterwards until I get done, you will get a different SummerSlam review from a show from the past. I will be covering shows from 1988 to 2012. You might ask why is SummerSlam 2013 not a part of the list? Because that review is already on this channel so you can look for it and check that out. So today I start off this series by talking about the first ever SummerSlam that occurred on August 29th, I believe it was, 1988 in good old Madison Square Garden. Now to give you a little backdrop in terms of how I'm going to do the reviews in this series. I'm not going to do use a bunch of funky characters, but I'm also not going to sit here and talk about every single match in great length and detail. I don't think that's necessary, and I don't necessarily think it's called for. I'm going to talk about the important, the significant things, by and large, that happen on these shows. Because, again, oftentimes with these shows, we don't remember every single match. We don't care about every single match. We don't care about every single thing that happens. We care about the good. We care about the bad. We care about the disappointments. We care about the surprises. You know, These are the type of things that I'm going to talk about in this review series. If you want star ratings for matches, watch somebody else's fucking series because I'm not doing that shit here, period. Now let's give you some historical backdrop in terms of how SummerSlam came to be. This was really the culmination of several things uh, with the WWF. You know, you obviously you had the great success of the first couple of WrestleManias, especially WrestleMania 3, where they drew over 93,000 people to the Pontiac Silverdome. You know, then with the success of those pay-per-view events, Vince McMahon was looking to capitalize on that and create some new events. And he created Survivor Series in 1987 in part to tap into this large growing pay-per-view market and also to capitalize on the feud between primarily Hogan and Andre. And what he did was he did this as a direct competition to Starcade and basically uh, put these cable company providers... Uh, balls to the grinder, if you will, and said, you either carry Starcade or you carry Survivor Series. If you don't carry Survivor Series, you're not going to be able to carry WrestleMania. I'm not going to give it to you. And that was really a major shot thrown, you know, even going back to the Black Saturday from a few years before. This was a really dirty, underhanded type of successful, smart business tactic that Vince McMahon used. So then he sits there and decides to run a free show, the Royal Rumble, on the USA Network in January of 88, primarily in large part to promote the rematch on the main event show the next month between Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant for the WWF Championship. You know, it drew record numbers, I think, uh, over 8 million viewers at that time, which was a huge cable number, still a big cable number to this day. So as a result... You know, Crockett's decided, well, F you, we're going to run a show called The Clash of Champions on TBS on free, you know, so to speak, cable television, head up against your WrestleMania 4, which will be on pay-per-view. And it kept going and going. You know, eventually the Crockett's had to sell out to Turner, and Vince decided he wanted to create another pay-per-view event to really, really, you know, capitalize on the growing momentum of the WWE and their growing success in the pay-per-view marketplace. And again, in part to capitalize on the Hogan and Andre feud and also, you know, kind of really cultivate the storyline between the mega powers, SummerSlam 1988 was created. Now, is this the greatest show in terms of pure in-ring action? If you're the type of guy that likes the flips and the kicks and the five-star classics, this isn't a show for you. But if you appreciate character development, if you appreciate storytelling, and you appreciate what the WWF used to be and what it could be, uh, this is the type of show for you because it really gives you a good historical perspective, in my opinion, of what this company could do and what this company was once able to do and make work. It was like at this time a lot of the things that they touched, frankly, turned to gold. You know, I will say this, though. If you are a hardcore wrestling fan, there is one match that beyond question you must check out on this show, and that's the very first ever match in SummerSlam history. And that is, of course, the British Bulldogs versus the Fabulous Rougeos in a 20-minute time draw. 20-minute time limit draw. This is an outstanding match. I know some people might complain that there wasn't a winner or a loser. I don't give a shit. It was 20 minutes of two great tag teams going out there and putting on a hell of a show. A hell of a show. 
And I've always asserted that the first match in SummerSlam history is still to this day to me one of the ten best SummerSlam matches in history. And that's this match right here. The Bulldogs versus the freaking Rougeos. And you'd have to assume with Davey Boy and the Dynamite Kid that this match would probably be pretty good. And it most certainly was. In terms of a pure wrestling standpoint, it was the match of the night. Some other things of note that happened on this show that should be interesting to you if you get, care again about the history of professional wrestling, care about the history of the WWF, you like elements of good storytelling, you look at Rick Rude versus the Junkyard Dog, and this was at a time where Rick Rude was beefing with Jake Roberts. They were incorporating Jake's wife, real-life wife, mind you, Cheryl, into the storyline, and Rick Rude was making moves on her. He was manhandling her. He was being fucking awesome Rick Rude. We get this match against the Junkyard Dog, and Rick Rick Rude reveals that he's wearing freaking Cheryl's face on the ass, or was it the balls? I can't remember which one, of his fucking tights. And out comes Jake the Snake like a fucking bullet, 300 miles an hour down the damn ramp to attack him like any man should if another man was wearing his wife's likeness on his damn tights. It leading to a disqualification victory for Rick Rude and ultimately, you know, setting up uh, an awesome kind of oh, this is great moment, you know, way to go, Jake, type of moment, and the type of shit that you would come to expect from a great performer like Jake the Snake Roberts. Another match on this show that is significant, not because of its length or not because of its quality, but because of how it was presented and how it was built up to and how it was led up to and how it was executed was the Honky Tonk Man putting his Intercontinental Championship on the line here against a yet-to-be-named opponent. Now, at this time, the Ultimate Warrior Carrier character, excuse me, was really starting to pick up steam. It was really starting to go. It was really starting to work. And he needed that kind of signature moment at a show like this to really put him on the map. And here you've got the Honky Tonk Man, the longest reigning Intercontinental Champion in the company's history still to this day. His original opponent for SummerSlam was Brutus Beefcake, and that ultimately didn't happen. So you needed to do something else here. At times, I'm a very big fan of short matches. At times, I'm a very big fan of squash matches, especially if the situation is right, especially if the circumstance is right, especially if the story was right. And all of those elements were perfect here. And Vince McMahon and the WWF made the 1,000% correct decision to have the Ultimate Warrior come out and obliterate the Honky Tonk Man in the way that he fucking did. Credit to the Honky Tonk Man for doing the job in the way he did, knowing, you know, that maybe he shouldn't have had to do it, but he did it. It was best for business, and I think Honky Tonk Man oftentimes doesn't get the credit that he deserves for putting Ultimate Warrior over in a big way here, in the right way here, that helped create a future star going forward. I think Howard Finkel also deserves a lot of credit for getting run over by the Ultimate Warrior and being able to walk out unscathed. But this is when a squash match can work. This is when a squash match is better than having a 10 or 15 minute wrestling classic. This is when you create memorable, magical moments. This is when you sit there and really establish a character as a big deal. This is when you really establish a character as somebody that you need to take serious in the future. And for all the talk about the great Intercontinental Champions over the years, I think oftentimes, because of the perception of him not being the greatest in the ring, the Ultimate Warrior doesn't nearly get the credit he deserves for being the great Intercontinental Champion that he was when he clearly was. This was phenomenal Phenomenally well done. The concept, the execution was mwah, say magnifique. Another good match on this show. It wasn't the best tag team match on this show. Of course, I went to the Bulldogs versus the Rougeos. But you had Demolition taking on the Hart Foundation for the WWF Tag Team Championships. This was a good match. You know, this is back at a time when I'm growing up as a kid when there are great tag teams all over the fucking place. So for some of you that are a little bit younger or maybe just came into wrestling over the past few years, and maybe you don't quite fully understand or get why so many of us older fans love tag team wrestling and get so pissed off about the WWE's utter and complete lack of interest in developing a real tag team division, and frankly, TNAs as well. It's because of stuff like this. You had the freaking Bulldogs and the Rougeos in one tag match. Hell, you had the Powers of Pain and Bolsheviks in another tag match. Not that that really deserves much mention, but still. And then you freaking had Demolition, and you had the freaking Heart Foundation here. And there were other teams in the mix at the time, too. An outstanding wealth of talent for the WWE, an outstanding, as a result, tag team division. And this was a really, really good match. 
Uh, but ultimately, this show was built around one match. Ultimately, this show was built around the main event. It was when the Mega Powers were going to beat the Mega Bucks. Now, there's always been a story out there talking about how the original designs for this event in 1988 was that the main event was going to be Ric Flair taking on Randy Savage for the WWF Championship. And that they were going to do something else with Hogan and Andre. That was the original plan or design, reportedly, is that, you know, with uh, Turner buying out Crockett and taking it over and it becoming WCW, that Flair was going to sit there and take the time and opportunity to jump ship and go to New York. Now, maybe he was close. Maybe he felt too much of an obligation to the NWA. Maybe he wasn't ready to leave home because he felt comfortable where he was. But it ultimately didn't happen. And I still think at the end of the day that that worked out just fine. I know a lot of people would have sat there and said, man, imagine how much better this show would have been if you'd had Hogan and Andre and freaking Savage and Flair main eventing this show. And to a degree, you're absolutely right. But then I look at it, how would that have set up the Mega Powers? And, you know, this is the whole thing to me. It's the Mega Powers. It's the Mega Bucks. You've got Jesse the Body Ventura as a special guest referee. Still to this day can never figure out why he had to sit there and change the tag ropes to the under, other turnbuckles. I will never figure that out. Nonetheless, was this a wrestling exhibition? No. Is this a wrestling classic? No. Does this perfectly crystallize and embody a lot of the good things that the WWE used to be? You goddamn right it was. You think about this. This Hogan Andre story went back to before WrestleMania 3, which was in the early months of 1987. Here we are at the end of August in 1988, and you can still main event a fucking pay per view and draw huge money in the garden and on pay per view, which was a new concept still at the time, with having Hogan and Andre face off in the main event. When people talk about some of the greatest rivalries in the history of the business, to not talk about Hogan and Andre to me is a goddamn shame. Because there are very few rivalries or feuds that could ever equal the amount of money drawn by those two feuding. Just think about that for a second. And then you incorporate Savage and you incorporate DiBiase. And you've got this whole thing that goes back again to WrestleMania 4 when Savage beat DiBiase in the finals of that tournament to win the vacated WWF Championship. You know, the way they layered everything in here. Obviously, Hogan and Savage were freaking aligned as the Mega Powers. Oh, fuck! This is when wrestling was fun, damn it. This is when it was a great time to be a kid and be a wrestling fan. And even the way that they incorporated Miss Elizabeth into this whole storyline. You know, today's world, her distraction would be nothing. But in the scope and parameters and the perspective of viewing it in the backdrop of 1988, her distraction was freaking genius. Her distraction was freaking awesome. It's that simple. The Mega Powers beat the Mega Bucks. And you know, again, not only was this done to kind of slowly break off Hogan and Andre, kind of get away from Savage and DiBiase, it was also to continue the animosity and the build towards the feud that was to come with the explosion of the Mega Powers at WrestleMania Five. When you go back and watch these type of shows, one thing that really stands out to you if nothing else, and it definitely does with me, is that you could see that at this time, the WWE had long-term vision in all of their booking. And even when they didn't, in the case of, let's say, the Ultimate Warrior beating the Honky Tonk Man at SummerSlam 88, they still had things positioned where you could throw out a Brutus the Barber Beefcake who you had been building up to, who you had been setting up to. You could slide in the Ultimate Warrior, and damn it, not only would it work, it would work better than what the original plan was all along. If you're a fan of old school wrestling from the WWF, if you're a fan of storytelling, if you're a fan of real feuds and rivalries, if you like to see what the WWE used to be able to do, this is the type of show that you need to go back to. And ultimately, it's really hard to grade this show badly because you can sit there and say, well, some of the matches were bad. You did, ah, shut the fuck up. It's not always just about the goddamn in-ring action. It's not always just about the stupid fucking star ratings. But when you look at this pay-per-view, we're going to have a SummerSlam 2014. That's what, 26 years later? Obviously something went fucking right. And clearly, this show got it done. And I love this show. It's not one of the great WWF pay-per-views of all time. But it definitely will always have a special place in my heart because of some of the things that happened on the show and the way some of the things were done. So thanks for tuning in for this. Tomorrow, 
Next up in this series will be SummerSlam 1989.